Welcome everyone. Uh, we're gonna get started for this evening's Indigenous Pedagogies Roundtable. My name is Christine DeLucia, and I would like to turn this over to my colleague, Dr. Joy James. This is our land and labor acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that Williams College stands on the ancestral homelands of the Stockbridge Muncie Mohicans, who are the indigenous peoples of the region now called Williamstown. Following tremendous hardship after being forced from their valued homelands, they continued as a sovereign tribal nation in Wisconsin, which is where they reside today. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. We also recognize that the institutions we occupy, where we are privileged to learn and teach, have developed in places where indigenous and African people have been enslaved and rendered unfree in other ways. Given the labor extraction that is foundational to such colleges and universities, we ask for and seek ways of making restitution that will constitute some forms of freedom. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. James, uh, for this land and labor acknowledgement. Um, so we'll get started uh, and give plenty of time for hearing from our participants this evening and having a wonderful and rich dialogue. And we very much hope that those joining in this evening will share thoughts and questions uh, through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you also have at the bottom of your screen the option to show captions um, if you wish to turn that on. Uh, tonight's event owes to many people for organizing and I would like to briefly acknowledge the extraordinary work as part of the Just Futures initiative um, that has enabled this. In particular, support from colleagues in the Office of Institutional Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, including Drs. Yvonne Garcia and Letitia Haynes, the Oakley Center at Williams College, and our colleague Carrie Green in college events uh, for tremendous um, making sure that this all works. Uh, this is part of a series of roundtable dialogues that have come together. And we welcome you to visit the Williams Just Futures website to access recordings uh, and soon transcriptions of previous conversations. Um, so I am going to introduce our panelists this evening and then turn it right over uh, for their own sharing out about experiences. And uh, as I share their bios, I was uh, reflecting on the incredibly wide range of work of learning and teaching that everyone's lives uh, takes up. It is not only or even necessarily primarily something that happens in academic classrooms, um, but much beyond that and in and with community. So in the order in which we will hear from our presenters, uh, first, Dr. Chadwick Allen, professor of English and adjunct professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Washington, where he also serves as the associate vice provost for faculty advancement author of the books Blood Narrative, Indigenous Identity in American Indian and Maori Literary and Activist Texts, Trans-Indigenous Methodologies for Global Native Literary Studies, and Earthworks Rising, Mound Building in Native Literature and Arts. He is a former editor for the journal Studies in American Indian Literatures, a past president of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, and a founding co-director for the UW's Center for American Indian and Indigenous Studies. Next will be Dr. Sandra Barton. Uh, Sandra Sandy Barton, uh, PhD, is an enrolled member of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians, is the author of The Standard Model of Indigenous Learning, or SMIL. Uh, moving home to Wisconsin after 35 years as a geology professor, Dr. Barton was hired as the first training and improvement coordinator for the Stockbridge Muncie community and tasked with building a training department. Sandy develops and, prevent, and presents professional development workshops in various settings across the country with continued research in the implementation of the SMIL in indigenous and non-indigenous communities. Her current article, a reflective revisit of the standard model of indigenous learning turning a theoretical model into application is in the review process. Next will be Dr. Americo Mendoza Mori. Dr. Americo Mendoza Mori is a lecturer in Latinx studies 
and faculty director of the Latinx Studies Working Group at Harvard University. His research focuses on Latin American, US Latinx, and indigenous communities. Mendoza Mori's work has appeared in a variety of academic journals, has been presented at the United Nations, and has been featured in the New York Times, Library of Congress, a TEDx talk, BBC, NPR, and Remez Club. He has been involved in educational and community-based initiatives in Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, and the US. Next will be Andana Spears, Diné Ojibwe Chickasaw Choctaw, an educator working in the public humanities. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree in anthropology from the University of Denver and has worked for the Heard Museum, Museum of Northern Arizona, Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center, and is the 2021 to 23 Tribal Community Member in Residence at Brown University. Andonis is the co-director of the Upstander Academy and a founding member of the Akhmat Educational Initiative, an indigenous education and interpretive consultancy for museums, K through 12 schools and colleges and universities. Originally from Camp Verde, Arizona, she lives in the homelands of her husband and four children, unceded Narragansett territory in South County, Rhode Island. Next will be Taisha Zintek. Taisha Zintek is a citizen Potawatomi Nation tribal citizen. With, helps, with help from a Gates Millennium Scholarship, she graduated magna cum laude from the University of Notre Dame in 2009 with her BA in English. After graduation, Taisha spent two years teaching and running an after-school program in Puerto Rico before pursuing her MA in education policy from Stanford University in 2013. To celebrate her achievements, Taisha has received the Howard Yakus Memorial, Next Gen 30 Under 30, and NCAIED Native American 40 Under 40 Awards. In 2015, she established her tribe's first Department of Education, where she continues to serve as director. She serves as president of the National Indian Education Association, president of the Oklahoma Council for Indian Education, and vice president of the Tribal Education Department's National Assembly. Since 2012, Taisha has also served as Potawatomi Leadership Program Advisor, building curriculum for the Harvard Honoring Nations award-winning internship program. What an exceptional and knowledgeable group to have with us. We are so grateful for your time. And with this, we'll turn this over to Dr. Chadwick Allen to get us started. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Christine. I'm gonna share my screen. Good evening, everyone, and Shokma. Good to see you all. And so I'll make sure, can everyone see that? I'm gonna assume, great. So um, I decided to title my remarks, um, Centering Indigenous uh, Methodologies. I said, I'm Chad Allen from the University of Washington in Seattle. And I wanted to begin by saying that the University of Washington is located on the lands and waters of Coast Salish peoples. And we serve a diverse uh, body of indigenous students and indigenous communities in our local region. We're also really located at the intersection of Native North America and Oceania. And I wanted to start with that because I think it's really important when we're thinking about indigenous pedagogies that location matters, where we are matters and how we think about um, doing indigenous pedagogies in various types of classrooms and outside of classrooms. Um, I also think that infrastructure matters and that if we want to center indigenous methodologies in our teaching and our outreach and our work, um, it really helps to have infrastructure. So we're fortunate at the University of Washington that we have quite a bit of infrastructure for doing indigenous studies. So we have a separate department of American Indian studies that is a tenure granting um, inst uh, department that has its own major and minor. We also have a center for American Indian and indigenous studies that runs a lot of programming. And in addition to these, we have several other major parts of our infrastructure uh, through the School of Social Work. We have the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute, ERIE. We have the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture on our campus, which includes the Bill Holmes Center, which offers fellowships to community members who want to come into the museum and work with um, various items in our collections. We're very fortunate that we have native space on our campus. West Labalt, the intellectual house, is a longhouse style building that opened in 2015. And it's really a gathering space for native community um, from on and off campus. We also have native and native studies faculty and staff across all three campuses of the University of Washington, who are great resources for us. 
And we're fortunate that we have a director of tribal relations position who is on um, sort of our president's team to really work with the 29 federally recognized tribes in the state of Washington, as well as other urban and rural um, indigenous communities um, in our state and in our region. What I wanted to focus on in my uh, limited time today is a particular program that we've run since 2016 at the University of Washington that we call the Summer Institute on Global Indigeneities, or SIGI. And SIGI is a week-long intensive summer program for PhD students, so students pursuing uh, their doctorate degree um, in any discipline, but working within indigenous studies broadly defined. Um, it's this week-long intensive program. It's team taught by four American Indian and Indigenous Studies faculty from three institutions. So I'm part of the teaching team along with um, one of my colleagues, Tony Lucero, um, and then uh, two other colleagues, both of whom are Pacific scholars, uh, Hokalani Aikau and Vince Diaz. And each summer we've had a cohort of 12 PhD students. Um, they come from our own university, but also from other institutions. Part of what we're trying to do is to not only introduce um, our PhD students to their local cohorts in Indigenous Studies, but to help them start building a more national and even international um, cohort of Indigenous Studies um, colleagues. So our consortium thus far has included the University of Washington, University of Oregon, UCLA, University of Hawaii, Manoa, University of British Columbia, University of Utah, University of Minnesota, and uh, University of Victoria up in um, Canada along with UBC. So here's a little bit of our website for SIGI from the last time we ran it in 2022. Um, we are fortunate that we have uh, good funding sources as part of our infrastructure. Our Humanities Center helps uh, support this. We uh, fortunately were the recipient of a large Mellon grant in 2018, and we were just renewed um, about a month ago uh, for the next four years. And that really helps us uh, fund so that we can really support all of the students um, who come to us uh, for the SIGI experience. So SIGI is meant to be really a space for articulating indigenous studies. And it's not so much based on a specific curriculum. We don't have assigned readings necessarily, but it's really a space for students who are working in indigenous studies to professionalize, to think about how to articulate their projects in indigenous studies for multiple audiences. So our key mission in articulating indigenous studies is to help provide a set of epistemological, methodological, and professional strategies for students' successful completion and dissemination of creative research projects in Indigenous studies, and to help students make their Indigenous studies projects legible to multiple audiences. This is really a response to um, hearing graduate students talk about the difficulty sometimes of trying to do Indigenous studies work in various disciplines. How could they articulate their projects in ways that will be legible um, to colleagues in their specific discipline, discipline, while also being legible to the interdiscipline of Indigenous studies, and how will it be legible as well in their Indigenous communities, either the ones they're working in or the ones they might be from. So we have some specific outcomes then that we're hoping students will leave our week-long uh, intensive experience with. So we're hoping that they'll leave with a strong understanding of various strategies for conducting Indigenous-focused research toward formal presentation and publication. Um, we're hoping they'll be able to describe their projects in concise and provocative ways. We're hoping that they'll be able to make the case for their work in the context of Native American studies, Indigenous studies, Native Pacific studies, and their respective disciplines. And the final two outcomes, we're hoping that they'll be able to articulate the relationships between the local and global in the work of Indigenous studies and that they'll be able to describe the importance of their relationships to the research sites, to their archives, and to the communities um, they work with. So how do we do that? I wanna spend most of my time, a few minutes here, talking about the specific methodologies we use in our SIGI program. So I've highlighted five key methodologies that we use that I think um, are portable, although I think that we need to localize them um, in your specific space, right? That would really make sense for um, the students you're working with and the lands and waters that you're working on. One of our methodologies is to begin with formal introductions and then to continue to introduce ourselves to each other throughout the whole week. So we always send our students a prompt for preparing to introduce themselves to each other, to the teaching team, to others on our campus when they visit us. And part of that is for them to think about 
whose lands and waters do they live and work on? And what's their relationship to that place? Do they know the name for who they are in the local language? Can they use that local language to describe their relationship? Are they a member of that community? Are they a guest? Are they a settler? Are they a visitor? What type of relationship do they have to those particular lands and waters? Another part we ask them to think about is, what ancestors do they carry with them when they come to do this work? I find this is a particularly powerful part of their formal introduction is to thinking that they don't come to the work alone. And that part of doing things through indigenous methodologies is thinking about the ancestors we carry with us into all of our research um, situations. So we practice this, we have them prepare for the first day and then they find themselves in various um, situations where they need to introduce themselves across the entire week. And so they use that similar types of prompt. Another practice that we use is what we call the Aloha Circle and the Mahalo Circle. This is coming from Hawaiian practice. Our colleague, Hokulani Aikau, introduced this to us um, our first year. And it's a way really of opening and closing um, our week together, as well as opening and closing each day that we spend together um, in the Sigi week. So the Aloha Circle, we begin, we make a circle. Um, typically, we hold hands. It was a little difficult during COVID, but if possible, making that physical contact and everyone goes around and reintroduces themselves every morning and says which ancestors they're bringing that particular day. And if they want to say why they've chosen those particular ancestors for that particular day of um, the Sigi experience. At the end of the day, then we have a mahalo circle or a circle of gratitude. And everyone expresses something they're grateful for um, that happened that day. Um, sometimes this gets quite emotional, but it's really important for students to, to sort of process what's happening um, in this sort of intense professionalization experience. We do that each day, and then we have, of course, have a final um, closing Mahalo Circle at the end of the week. That turns out to also be a really important methodology for centering um, indigenous ways of knowing. A couple of other things that we do that have been really effective. One is we have a visualizing research exercise um, what we call indigenous collage. And we started this because of one of our first students um, in the first year we ran the SIGI program, an indigenous student from um, Canada was using collage as a methodology in her PhD work um, in indigenous governance and introduced it to her advisor and introduced it to the rest of us. And for us, what we think of it is, is a way for students to move out of um, the typical ways they're used to thinking about their research projects in their particular disciplines and have to think about how would you use the materials that are in front of you, the way you work with making a, a collage, and how would you work with the fragmented realities that are often the result of colonialism in indigenous communities? And so we break people up uh, in, into groups with uh, the materials, and we have them actually make a collage of their dissertation project. A lot of people think are a little wary of this at the beginning, and then people get very excited about it as people are passing around magazines and other visual material, cutting things up, gluing things together. And then after about a half day of working on the collages, we do a sort of um, round of show and tell, and everyone explains why they've chosen. And this too is often a very powerful way of people thinking about, well, how would you take the fragments of what's available and turn them into this major research project? So that too, I think has been a really powerful Indigenous methodology for our SIGI week. One thing we do every year we've done this is we make sure we go into an Indigenous community and have the experience of we're introducing ourselves and introducing the work we're doing to community members. Um, we're fortunate here at the University of Washington in Seattle that we're close to a number of local communities. Uh, we've mostly been going to the Suquamish Nation, which is just across the water from Seattle. Um, it's a nice sort of day trip. Um, they have a beautiful museum. They have a lovely long house, and they also have a canoe um, house. Um, we never know who's going to show up exactly, and that's part of the experience is going into community. Sometimes we meet with elders. Sometimes we meet with multi-generations of the local community. Sometimes we've had real focus on local children and young people. Um, sometimes we spent the day in the long house hearing stories and learning about uh, the local history. And sometimes we've gotten out on the water in canoes and had um, sort of a lesson in sort of embodied learning. Um, part of the project for the students, though, is gaining the confidence to explain who they are and what their work is um, in Indigenous community in ways that will be legible to elders, um, to multi-generations of the local community. 
And the final strategy I wanted to point to is we end the week then with a more formal presentation of uh, work, a more typical research symposium, but in the context of supportive community. And unlike often more dominant academy where we think of um, presentations and Q&A that can be sometimes um, overly formal and somewhat hostile, try to create this sort of supportive um, indigenous community for presenting work. We give really clear parameters for the students on how they're gonna present their work to that particular audience. And then we end um, with a sort of feast and bringing our whole community together to sort of close out the week. So what I really wanna leave you with is the thinking about how to stage a sort of professionalization in indigenous studies in ways that really draw on indigenous ways of knowing and really creating indigenous community um, at multiple levels uh, for our students. So I'm gonna end there and I look forward uh, to our conversation. Thank you. I am going to share my screen. There we go. And let's get up here. There we go. Um, Kolomalsi, my English name is Sandy. My mother is Claudette Miller Weiderman. My grandparents are Arnold and Lydia Miller, who attended the Indian Mission Boarding School. This is my grandmother here in yellow and her sister, my great aunt in orange and a bunch of my cousins in the background. This was um, a reunion of the boarding school children. My great grandparents are Cassie and Wellington Miller. Wellington is a survivor of the Hampton Institute Boarding School in Virginia. I am a first generation college graduate who experienced stopouts and well, slowdowns and one stop out to work in the oil fields. Um, I am so honored to be here at this round table today. And it's wonderful to see the impressive and much needed work that's being carried out by the younger generation. It just makes my heart sing. And I would like to thank those responsible for making this event possible. This is good work that is being done. I would like to read something before we start, and this is by Henry Brilberg. It's called This Day. The spring rains we've reached, the blue-green grass grows each day, and so will your thoughts. Fantasy does not belong to you, it belongs to all of us. That's what learning is all about. Theories and concepts are taught, but a feeling cannot be bought. We ask for the feeling of learning from sacred talk. And I really love this because it reminds me that while I am talking that my breath is sacred, my words are sacred. And so I need to have good intentions and good thoughts while I share with you. So as a little background, this is my dissertation title and you'll see that it was published in 20. 13, although I had started my graduate work in the early 2000s, um, I pouted a few years. So as an elder, let me tell you young ones, don't pout, okay? Just keep putting one foot in front of the other and get yourself finished. Um, anyways, in the late 1990s, there was a big push for DL, distance learning, and I was concerned that that might be the final step in the assimilation of our people. And I was also concerned about the digital divide and the construction of additional barriers being erected to keep people of the global majority from education, even though DL was being touted as this panacea to reach all peoples. And I just thought, yeah, we've seen how well Eurocentric education has been for the um, indigenous world. So I started with that and I ended up, you'll see, it says towards a standard model of indigenous learning because I really didn't know what I had and what I had done or how it was going to be used. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, one of my very first classes, I had to write two 10 page papers on a dissertation topic and I had no clue what I was gonna write about. So I said, okay, Tribal colleges, I wanna know about them. Very quick, easy paper, all historical, how they started, their journey, and what their future plans were. So I had been learning um, 
in my courses about educational philosophies, learning theories, instructional design models. And I thought, ooh, I'm going to go find and write about an indigenous learning model. Yeah, I was kind of naive. Um, all of the stuff, the academic stuff that I'd been learning was all Eurocentric based back in the early 2000s. I learned something very important though. Um, there were no set definitions for indigenous education or learning, seriously. And this is why I have a picture of those uh, dream catchers up there. You could have a non-indigenous person telling an indigenous group to make a dream catcher. And that would be considered indigenous education. The checkbox would be made for diversity and inclusion, boom. Yeah, I'm cringing just like you're all cringing about that, right? Because even today, this is still happening where, oh, let's have this group make a set of teepees. Well, you know, teepees, my people didn't live in teepees. We had longhouses. So this indigenous learning and education, the words were mixed together and there was just no definite um, definition. So being a scientist, I really needed to figure this out. You know, so I spent a lot of time reading and talking digesting it and coming up with a uh, definition for indigenous learning. So you see Eurocentric learning, which most of us have experienced all of our life, it's basically to check the box, reach a specific goal. And with that, you've got an accomplishment and you have that power acquisition and then, or not power acquisition, but the knowledge acquisition, which is often used for power because we always hear, you know, um, knowledge is power. So the dominant culture has a tendency to use that to erect, maintain, and reinforce barriers. I mean, not so long ago, African-Americans, it was illegal to teach them to read and write. Women were not allowed in higher um, institutions of learning at all. Um, but on the other hand, indigenous learning is not like that. What I found through all my research is that learning is life and life is learning. We learn, we pass it on to ensure the survival of our communities. I mean, if you learn, if you didn't learn, you died, isn't it, you know? So it's true, there's some information related to ceremony and medicines that's not openly shared. But generally, we get information, we share it. So this is the definition that I came up with. It's the process of Native Americans receiving and internalizing information in order to solidify their place and interconnectedness with all others, seen and unseen, and then the knowledge can be shared. So as I had mentioned, um, as I was going through the research, I couldn't find indigenous learning theory in um, educational philosophies, instructional design models, no theoretical frameworks. Um, there were some general guideline suggestions, or there would be very specific guidelines that were developed for a tribe, just a specific tribe that related to their teachings. Um, but while I was going through all of this, um, reading the literature, the scholarly literature, the not so scholarly literature, right? And um, interviewing and discussing, discussions with a lot of people, I came up with five threads that seemed to go through all of the material. I mean, it was just hiding in plain sight. It was just really amazing. And these threads are all, I think, indigenous, indigenous learning pre-contact. And that's why I think it's so important and why it resonates. So when I have um, a group of indigenous people, I will start with plays. But um, I'm gonna start with storytelling right now because it is a part of us. We have an oral tradition. We share our stories in the classroom. Every lecture is a story. And as you speak with someone else, you are weaving a story with your sacred breath and creating a memory or an experience. Intergenerational interaction, this is so very, very important. Our elders are our wisdom keepers and share their knowledge. Our children teach us as well. They teach us to stay curious, and they teach us to stay young at heart. So, you know, take a moment and think about someone from another generation who taught you something to cook, to harvest, how to work your iPhone, right? It happens. 
The next one is experience. We can hear, we can see, we can witness, we can smell, but it's not the same. And someone can tell us, we can read about it, but it's not the same as experiencing an event. When you experience that event, it becomes part of you. It becomes part of your place, okay? So it's very important. And I put this picture up because you see a picture on a cat of a uh, cat on a slew of papers. I see that in the experience of my fifth night editing my final edits on my dissertation, two o'clock in the morning, you know, exhausted. The cat just laid down and said, no, go to bed. So I took his advice. Interconnectedness. This is the belief that everything is connected physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. You know, how are we connected and why is it important? I mean, learning is all about relationships and connection. If you don't have it, you know, why, why are you learning? And this last one is place. Some people think of their house, right? And then some people think of where they are in relation to other people, kind of like the where's Waldo. But some people, um, they understand that it's everything. It's in us and it changes constantly, but it doesn't change. Place is hard to define using Anglo words, but I'll try. It is more than a physical location. It is the emotional and spiritual connection of oneself to the universe and all that it contains at a specific instant in space and time. So your place has changed from an hour ago and will continue to change, but it really doesn't change because it's you, right? So to wrap it up real quick here, after I finished my dissertation, I kind of just let it go. Um, not knowing what would happen. And out of the blue in the fall of 2021, Katie Archer Olson contacted me asking permission to use the SMILE, the S-M-I-L, as part of her theoretical framework for her dissertation. Uh, she also told me that Laura Moore had used my um, standard model of indigenous learning as a case study of a TCU in Northern Wisconsin, that's a tribal college. She validated that the threads were being used unconsciously by the instructors. It was in the curricula, uh, the syllabi, the lectures that she attended, and in the handbooks. So that was nice to know. Katie also told me that she took those threads and developed a rubric, and she calls it an instructional design framework. And since implementing, she's had significant um, results in the passing rates of her students. She works for a small Alaska college, uh, that has the highest enrollment of a, uh, Alaska Natives, Native Americans, representing 23 villages. So she takes and she puts all of the threads across the top, and then vertically she runs her weeks with the assignments, and then she just makes sure that they match together. So the one last thought I want to leave you with is that most curriculum is built around white comfort. So even if we indigenize or indigenize um, curricula, we still need to have a robust framework to hold what's been developed. Um, if the framework for supporting that curriculum isn't there, or if it's Eurocentric, then that curricula is just gonna fall through. You know, It's like putting berries in a basket that has holes. It's just not retained. Anisha Onui, Thank you for listening to my story about the smile. If you want to contact me, please feel free. Thank you so much, Dr. Barton uh, and uh, Dr. Mendoza Mori. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. I'm very inspired by these uh, presentations. Uh, and I hope also to join uh, by providing, by sharing some of the work I've been in, involved with. I would like to um, start sharing my screen and and the title of my presentation, Indigeneity and Latinidad, Educational Planning and the Future of Latinx Studies in the United States. Um, I also want to greet you in, in Quechua, uh, in Mainaya, which is the most spoken um, indigenous language family of the Americas with 10 million of speakers. If we put that into perspective, it's kind of like the same amount of uh, speakers of Swedish, more speakers than Danish. Um, so moving into that is like, what do we imagine um, when we think of indigeneity in connection to Latinidad? And just in case these ideas come from these publications or links that I um, invite you to expand more if, if you would like to engage with these conversations. But maybe let's uh, start by sharing that whenever we think of like indigeneity in Latin America, we tend to think of archeological places, very famous like Machu Picchu, Teotihuacan, Chichen Itza. They're part of the national narrative of many countries um, or folklorical uh, celebrations or traditional celebrations that have been part of the national, the, like national narratives. However, sometimes uh, we tend to focus on the past tense, like the Incas were great, the Mayans were great, always in the past tense. But we, we fail to see the first, the ongoing demands of many indigenous populations, but also the creativity of the youth. Uh, now there are generations of musicians, artists, diplomats, who are fighting for creating more spaces uh, within indigeneity and Latinidad in Latin America. But this conversation is more about what happens in the United States. As we know, there are many migrant communities in the US diaspora. And sometimes just by the name Latinidad or Hispanidad, the emphasis in the definition is on the European heritage. But I wanted to share these pictures from New York, for example, and from the Southern United States of Latin celebrations, of Hispanic celebrations, that we can see that they're clearly carrying indigenous heritage and presence. And many hundreds, thousands of these uh, migrant communities also count with indigenous migrants, indigenous language, speakers that could be Quechua, Zapotec, and Maya. If we expand that into the conversation, into the public conversation, Latine websites in the U.S. have hi highlighted that even among the youth, second, third generations of Latin American descent, uh, U.S.-born Americans, uh, they they want to expand or make more complex the definitions of Latinidad. And they realize that the, the lack of this conversation is also into the, into the detrimental of the diversity of the community. And here are some examples from the website uh, Remezcla. From the university then, when we look at this reality, what are we, what are universities or schools doing then the, to the support um, indigenous languages and cultures? And how can we change the narrative of promoting open discussions at large about the coloniality, about anti-blackness and, and anti-indigeneity? In particular, in connection to Latinidad, if we go through the, let's say, the curricular aspect, as Professor Anne Fontaine mentions, there is there are a few texts used in, in, in even um, Spanish or Hispanic studies that attempt to focus on the contemporary presence of indigenous communities. But then if we look, if we have a wider look at Latinidad on campuses, we then see that there are celebrations like Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, celebrations of Taino heritage, um, Quechua-inspired uh, dances. 
So it is there. It's just that we don't talk much about that or the way it should be. Why? I mean, not just in, in the US, but usually the narrative around Latinidad is that there is a claim that everyone of Latina heritage is mixed, is mestizo, mestiza, and therefore that kind of makes it easier to dismiss indigenous or Afro heritage within the community. So talking about indigeneity and Latinidad, we should see it as an opportunity to expand the notions of this discipline. And how can we expand those notions in a cultural, but also in a curricular way? Well, as we mentioned, we already have community manifestations on campus, could be Day of the Dead, or could be particular celebrations. But as a scholars, and as um, uh, it was also mentioned in previous presentations, curricular presence and methodologies are very important. One aspect that is gaining momentum, even though, of course, indigenous communities have been doing that for a while, is the discussion of indigenous knowledge systems, a series of practices and wisdoms developed within indigenous societies from across the world. And just being aware of that within the curricular, um, uh, within the curricular platforms is, uh, and across disciplines is a way to, to consider that there is a tradition of knowledge, not just to know, let's say, more in a topic, but also to know uh, in a different way. And what do I mean by learning in a different way? Is to actually understand that storytelling, practices, dances that indigenous communities bring also should get the same status as science, philosophy. And that's why we as educators have the challenge to facilitate that breaching and to provide examples. Because sometimes people might say, well, I don't do indigenous studies, so why should I care? But maybe we do care about food security or technology or philosophy or, health, or healthcare or entrepreneurship or the idea of reparations. And for each of these topics, we can make connections with indigenous knowledge systems. And once we do that, then of course we need to bring voices and to put particular examples. Uh, for example, I think in the case of uh, the word Pachamama, which is a word in Quechua that talks about the relationship with the earth, not, a, not a, only as a commodity, but as we belonging to the earth. And then of course we need the same way as when we learn French or Greek philosophy, we need Plato or Foucault. Well, we need to find voices and learn from those voices. I'm thinking of my dear colleague, Tarsila Rivera, who is a Quechua activist and uh, I'm very um, present in, in, in global platforms and practices like Andenes that are concrete examples of care of the Pachamama, but also in connection to environmental studies. As we can see, and probably it's very obvious for people who are connected to these topics, is also to be intentional that abstraction that is very praised in academia, no? the theoretical underpinnings, is very attached to practice in the case of indigenous communities and knowledges. And therefore, explicitly talking about the need of moving from research in indigenous cultures as just things of the past to understand their complexity and contributions while fostering collaborations. Of course, making this indigenous studies program or indigenous language programs is also a way to acknowledge the colonial legacy on where we are standing, institutions of higher ed, um, ed, but also to send a message, hopefully, that things are changing. I would say that there are many opportunities to do community outreach, to recognize the contemporary indigenous heritage, to foster dialogues north, south, to enrich the curricula, specifically in, in the case of Latinidad, to enrich Latin American, Hispanic, or Latina studies, uh, including the offering of indigenous languages or courses on that particular topics, uh, to invite uh, uh, speakers, to then make that an, a center, recentering Latinidad around 
indigenous issues around um, Afro uh, diasporic issues. These are pictures, for example, with Quechua writers, with a Zapotec poet, Dr. Uh, Felipe Lopez, with Quechua musicians and students here at, at Harvard. These language projects also facilitate identity-oriented experiences among the participants, particularly in this case, US Latinx youth who are affirming their voices while navigating the challenges of a racialized society. This picture that you are seeing here, and I'm going to share the next picture as well, belong to the Quechua Alliance, which is an annual gathering that happens in the United States, which is intergenerational, multilingual, to celebrate the uh, relevance of Quechua, but also recognize that universities are now have more diverse bodies and therefore universities are where in the youth are receiving their education. And we need to make sure that those spaces are not just, don't continue the acculturation. This image is from right just a couple of weeks ago here at Harvard, the seventh Quechua Alliance annual meeting. Um, as I mentioned, universities are becoming more diverse, and hopefully um, that could be a way to express also to the administration that, that these diversity initiatives, and I'm thinking more of universities that are not tribal colleges, but uh, of course, because they, they those other institutions have different needs. Um, but in this case, it's to, to say that it's not that they're making as a favor, but actually is a way to keep up and to be at the forefront of conversations, to don't only, let's say, shoot for being global, uh, which is usually the usual narrative we get in, in, in academia or in society or, or in corporate spaces, but the value of being intercultural and therefore make sure that indigenous voices are present. Once again, I just want to go after the list that I shared in case you find it interesting, or if you are ever consider these topics on how we could connect them with indigenous curricula, and therefore then include more of, uh, of indigenous voices and acknowledges into these disciplines, and of, uh, particularly in the case of uh, Latine, Latin American studies. Um, this, this uh, slide is just a summary of what I mentioned, and I'm happy to uh, keep up with the conversation. Um, my final thought, just to, to put that, is all to say that all of these strategies is to recenter indigeneity into contemporary issues and also to global issues. Uh, thank you very much, Anyai. Thank you, um, Dr. Mendoza Mari, and thank you all of our previous panelists. Um, such an honor to be here and to share with you this evening. Yat Esh a Indana Spears and Ishia Hashkan Hatsohonishla, Ojibwe people, Bashish Chin, Tanisani Dishiche, Do Chakta, and Chikisa people, Dishinele. Hi everyone, I'm Indana Spears and I am Yucca Fruit Strung Out in a Lion Clan. I'm an enrolled citizen of the Navajo Nation. I'm born for the White Earth Ojibwe people in White Earth, Minnesota. My maternal grandfather is from the Tangled Clan and my paternal grandfather is from the Choctaw and Chickasaw Nations in Oklahoma. And it is, uh, it is an honor to join you from the homelands and the home waters of the Narragansett people, the people of the small point in South County, Rhode Island. Um, as Dr. Delusha mentioned, I wear uh, several different hats uh, at the time being. Um, I co-founded a small consulting organization about four years ago. I also am the tribal community member in residence at Brown University, but this evening I am wearing my Upstander Academy co-director hat. And, um, and I'm talking a little bit about the work that we're doing at the Upstander Academy and share with you a little bit about um, hopefully some of the, the transformative work uh, we do with K through 12 classroom educators. Um, so just to share a bit about the Academy itself. Um, I have been the co-director 
uh, for several years now the Upstander Academy, which is also part of the Upstander Project. Uh, the Upstander Project was founded in 2009 by Dr. Michi Lesser and Adam Mazo. Um, and it is a Boston-based educational organization that uses film as a means to educate about um, genocide. And their original film uh, focused on post-genocide uh, uh, Rwanda. And uh, with that particular focus, there was also a suite of uh, educational teaching resources that Dr. Michi Lesser developed to uh, to be as a companion piece uh, to, that, to that documentary. Um, and uh, what became apparent and clear um, after that particular documentary was produced by the Upstander Project was the need to teach about genocide education in the United States. And so the Upstander Academy uh, was formed to give classroom educators the tools that they need to teach about genocide in the United States which is a completely different cultural and historical context than teaching about genocide across oceans or genocides that happen on different continents. The requirements that classroom educators in our K through 12 public school systems uh, need to teach about genocide in the United States where they live and learn uh, is a completely different set of tools. And so uh, in partnership with uh, my dear colleagues uh, at the Upstander Academy, we have assembled a faculty of native and non-native teachers and educators who come from multiple roles in their own tribal communities and within their uh, academic communities uh, to convene with classroom educators and also with museum educators. Uh, once a year in the summertime and provide them with a professional development that really centers an understanding and a deep understanding of the history of this continent and particularly the United States. Uh, so um, in the process of uh, developing a curriculum for the Upstander Academy, um, there are several things that have emerged as important uh, guiding principles or some of the, the basis of uh, what our teachers need, who are primarily non-native, although our participants are oftentimes native and non-native, um, but primarily, uh, a, a, primarily a, a participant pool that is white. Um, we, ha we have to recenter the way that we understand educational work. Uh, for them in their own classrooms. Uh, and so we uh, do our very best um, to embody and model some of these, uh, these ethical uh, practices of truth telling and truth teaching in classrooms uh, across the United States. Uh, one of which has already been referenced several times here tonight, which is the importance of expressing positionality to knowledge. Um, our teachers uh, come and bring with them ancestors and systems of knowledge that are of great import and are reflected back um, in the way that they do instruction in their classrooms. And we want to foster that and encourage our, our classroom teachers to understand what it means to have positionality to the subject matter that you are teaching. Um, also fostering a sense of intellectual humility um, by acknowledging that there are thousands of indigenous knowledge systems that predate um, uh, newer knowledge systems that, uh, uh, that were introduced in the process of settler colonialism, and that that acknowledgement in and of itself um, is a process of humbling and understanding um, the methods that are used by the current public school education system and understanding that uh, where those are rooted and why and how indigenous methodologies and ways of knowing and epistemologies um, have a very uh, deep history to the place where they do their education work. And so we do our best to um, uh, foster those kinds of conversations and to illustrate that for our classroom educators so they can begin to understand um, the homelands where they do their teaching and living. Uh, we also encourage a, a understanding as, um, as uh, 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 Sandra uh, mentioned earlier, 
uh, that there is no finality in the process of education. There is no end point, but this is a lifelong journey of learning and in the United States public school system, a journey of unlearning um, as well. And that those are counterparts to one another, but the learning requires unlearning uh, the, the, the master narrative that is presented within our K through 12 public school systems. So we also um, do our best to uh, model uh, uh, the mechanism through which uh, our classroom teachers can unlearn their own uh, educational experiences um, as they went through the K through 12 system here as well. Um, part of that is understanding uh, the uh, steps towards uh, acknowledging the denial of indigenous histories and contemporary continued existence uh, across Turtle Island and specifically across the United States um, and, and fostering again that conversation and that more uh, dialogic nature of learning with our, with our classroom educators and making sure that we implement the time, the space and the self care to allow our educators to engage in understanding um, the very depths of the denial that is sometimes required uh, to do education in our public school systems. Of course, we always uh, acknowledge the fact that the earth is our teacher, that the mother, that mother earth, the place, the geographic space upon which we live and learn is our original teacher. And that wherever our classroom teachers are living and learning and teaching also requires a sense of accountability uh, to that particular geographic space and an accountability to tell a comprehensive history and story and narrative um, of the places where they're doing their teaching as well. Uh, we talk about the purposes of settler education. Um, Again, it was already mentioned by some of our panelists here that uh, comfort is not the point, that we acknowledge the need for discomfort. We acknowledge the uh, importance of engaging with material uh, as human beings, engaging with uh, the material of how we develop um, not just history lessons, but any curricular lessons that our students, um, uh, our non-Native students are doing uh, in the United States, it requires um, discomfort. And so again, you know, much of the academy is really focused on uh, honoring the humanity of our classroom educators. Uh, they are uh, entrenched in a uh, education system that oftentimes does not acknowledge or honor the humanity of uh, both the educators, the administrators, and also the students themselves. Um, so it's a very, it's of utmost important to us, importance to us uh, as faculty on the academy to make sure that we honor the humanity of our classroom educators um, in this process as well. Um, of course, we want to create communities of co-conspirators that can lean on one another. Um, in their approaches and their very specific challenges that they receive in their respective school districts and in their respective classrooms. Um, so we really look to ensure that teachers uh, engage in an active community of learning and practice. And um, that is always um, at the forefront uh, of the work that we try to do, um, not just during our time together, um, but also um, after, after our sessions together as well. Um, I think that's something that has become readily apparent to us uh, who are on faculty, those of us that are also on this panel, uh, there are participants who are watching from home, um, that our K through 12 system um, in the United States is an incredibly powerful one. And it has the power to shape the way that Supreme Court justices um, uh, determine policy um, and, and make decisions. Um, and we really feel that this early intervention 
um, into our, our public school uh, classrooms is of great importance to our future generations. Um, and so in, in the spirit of kind of acknowledging my own positionality to this work um, as, as a mother, as a mother of four, um, it's of great importance to me to, um, I think as Dr. Allen mentioned uh, earlier, um, to help to uh, uh, cultivate uh, worlds that are uh, literate um, in indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing, which is the worlds that we are trying to uh, create for our own children. Um, and so that that is really um, the motivating uh, factor and acknowledging that um, is part of our of our modeling of practice. Um, I would uh, love to be in touch with um, any of our uh, viewers this evening, and I encourage you to visit uh, the Upstander Project um, as they uh, have ongoing uh, documentary films um, that are uh, being produced that focus uh, on the uh, indigenous ways of knowing and epistemologies uh, that are so important uh, for our classroom uh, educators to have access to, but also the public as well. So uh, thank you, thank you so much for, for your time and attention this evening. Hello, the Jacqueline Krishnabi no Swin, Tasha Zentek, and Dejmikas, Shani, Oklahoma, and Dochbia, Oklahoma City, and Dayan, Mako, and Dodem, Krishnabi, and Dal Shishi, Denny, and Zimbabwe. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Tasha Zentek, as mentioned earlier. My Pawani name is Jujakwi, which means like a crane. I'm originally from Shawnee, Oklahoma, but I live in Oklahoma City now. My uh, family is Bear Clan, and I am enrolled with the Citizen Hall of Nation. And I'm so honored and grateful to be with all of you today. And I have just been soaking up the wonderful presentations before me. And I am excited to share with you some of the work that's been happening at our tribal nation, the Citizen Hall of Nation. So we're going to kind of focus in on, on one tribal nation and what we've done to um, help our, help our uh, citizens feel connected to their identity. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, that, you know, because I'm zooming here from Oklahoma, that is this land that's now, that is now known as Oklahoma, is the homeland of the Wichita, Caddo, Apache, Comanche, Kiowa, and Osage, as well as several other than human relations that were negatively affected by settler colonialism. Thank you much for the opportunity to share with you all today. <laughs> so, uh, for those who may not be familiar with the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, I wanted to just give you just a bit of context that will help situate some of the programs that I'm going to share um, with you about today. So pre-contact, uh, our, um, our ancestors were uh, located in the northeast of what is now the U.S. and into what is now Canada. Um, and based on a prophecy, we migrated to the Great Lakes where food grew on water, where there was um, a nomen or wild rice. Then um, in the uh, 1830s, our, uh, the biggest of several removals for our people was known as the Trail of Death. And we were moved down to um, the Kansas area and then ultimately became citizens and landowners in Indian territory or what is now Oklahoma. And then of course, um, in the late 1880s, there was the Dawes Act, which split our land into uh, allotments. Now, the citizen Potawatomi Nation has over 38,000 tribal citizens living um, all over the world. But in understanding that context, you know, there are, are a lot of consequences. Was a, the aftermath of that, of that removal um, is very severe. And you know, so we've got our dis we have a disconnection from our homelands that I mentioned that where food grows on water, where our prophecies told us that we were to live. We are here in Oklahoma, we are we are so far from that uh, environment. We have distance from our northern relatives. There are um, several bands of Potawatomi throughout the US and Canada, and you know, we are geographically distanced in the most 
southern of those bands of Potawatomi. Our citizenship is hugely dispersed. Um, about two thirds live outside of Oklahoma where our tribe is headquartered. The language uh, just has been devastated by um, what's this history, going to account also the atrocities of boarding schools. And now um, not just within the citizen Potawatomi nation, but with all the Potawatomi communities as a whole, um, the average age of our eight remaining first language speakers is 82. And then of course, there's this isolation from community um, because people are so dispersed. I often talk to tribal citizens who own, the only other Potawatomi people they know um, are within their immediate. And so there's a, um, an insecurity or an uncertainty in relation to their tribal identity. So um, over the years, our tribe has tried to work to um, repair some of these um, consequences. And one of the programs I'd like to tell you about um, is known as the Potawatomi Leadership Program. Um, it was it started in 2003. Uh, at that time, uh, we had, uh, we, the tribe was giving out the most scholarships it had ever given, which was a, a moment of pride, but tribal leaders recognized that despite that, a lot of those college students didn't know anything about their tribal nation, um, uh, as is true now. Uh, the majority of our tribal leaders are, um, are in their elder years. And so when it came to think about who's going to take over as the, who's going to you know, assume that mantle as the next generation of leaders, we need tribal citizens who are connected to their identity, who have understanding of our tribal cultural ways, of our government structure, of our operations. Um, so this program was uh, an attempt to try to respond to that need. Um, and you'll notice you'll notice recurring um, this you know the similar image of a corn tassel, and the idea is um, that we are we uh, the idea is that if every year you um, have a corn harvest but you eat all of your corn you don't have any seed corn to plant for the next generation. Um, so the the Potawatomi leadership ship is an attempt to plant that seed corn to um, to prepare for um, that next generation of leadership and for the next seven generations of our tribal nation. So this program, and it started in 2003, whenever, um, when I was in high school, <laughs> in 2013, I had the opportunity to, to begin working with that program um, as the advisor and was able to work through some of the, the curriculum and revamp. So it's gone through a lot of changes over the years, but I am really, um, honored to work with the program and proud of the progress that we've had. So we invite 10 tribal citizens. It's a competitive application process, but we invite 10 Potawatomi, citizen Potawatomi students to live in Shawnee, Oklahoma, where our tribe is headquartered for six weeks. And essentially for those six weeks, we immerse them in their tribe. They interact with tribal leaders. And when I say tribal leaders, that's elected officials, that's tribal program directors, that's elders. Um, they get to ask them questions, find out about how all the pieces of the puzzle of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation fit together to run as it does. Uh, here you see a, photo, a picture of one of our weekly talking circles. So as some, you know, as some others shared, it's important for the students to process what they're learning. <laughs> they are, um, you know, sometimes I, perhaps overwhelmed with the amount of information they're learning, but this is a moment to pause to hear from their fellow peers, to um, tackle complex issues such as identity or what leadership looks like and means to them, what ideas they have for how the tribe should, um, should move. Uh, and then also they are required while they're with us to do some assignments to help kind of apply the new knowledge that they're learning. So one of those, the, the first assignment that they do is an elder interview. Again, with this idea that they, because they live in, um, who knows, they, they, they live in, you know, Northern California and they only know the, um, the, their immediate family, this is an opportunity either for them to connect to a tribal elder here in Oklahoma or, you know, another elder um, somewhere else, or sometimes it's just an opportunity to have a conversation with their um, grandparents. Uh, who they've never talked to about what it means to be Potawatomi. 
that knowledge, just they, you know, they know their Potawatomi, they just haven't had that conversation about what that means. So we ask them to have that, uh, that that dialogue and then to um, to capture that into in, into a short paper that becomes part of a final portfolio. And again, we talk about leaving that record, leaving that behind um, for the uh, next generation. They also work on a project. We pair them and we ask them to think about how they can leave an impact on the tribe. This is meant to, to be a um, mutually beneficial opportunity. So it's not that they're coming in and you know just dumping all of this knowledge or banking all this knowledge into them. They're coming with their own experiences and their own ideas, and they're seeing ways that the tribe could be um, could be better, could be more inclusive or more accessible. And so they are encouraged and um, required to put together a project with their partner um, that they eventually present to tribal leadership. So over the years, that's ranged from last year there was a TikTok cooking channel um, about with uh, with Potawatomi recipes. There has been um, one group, one one pair decided to write a drum song um, uh, to be used uh, for one of our ceremonies. There was there have been folks who have worked with specific tribal programs to address a need. So they're wide ranging and is wide open. But we want them to feel as if they're moving in. And then finally, they present a final reflection about their time, and all of that goes into a final portfolio. Since 2003, um, we have had uh, over 200 students participate in this program. Several of those students are now working here at the nation, um, or they've gone back to their own university where they started at Make American uh, you know, Student Associations or been instrumental in that. So, They've sort of bolstered their sense of identity, and now they're participating as leaders in the sense that that makes sense to them. Not just, you know, we expect you to run for tribal office, although, you know, we do hope that that is an outcome. It's also, we hope that you will be someone in your family who can share this knowledge. We hope that you um, may consider, uh, pass, that we hope that you pass on this information to your children. We hope that you are an engaged voter in our tribal election. Um, if you come back and work for the nation in some way. So that's a that's a program that's very close to my heart. And because that program has been so, so successful for years and years and years, I would hear from students' parents as they drop them off uh, for that program in Oklahoma. Man, I wish there was that program for me when I was that age. So students are aged 18 to 20. And so out of that program grew the Madonna Leadership Program. I think one of our students um, is on the call now, um, but the idea is this is because it's a seven week virtual program. This is about intergenerational community building. It is anyone years, 18 years of age or older. Um, because we have such a dispersed citizenship, it is virtual, so that's accessible. And then Ndaman in our language is how we refer to corn, but really what it really means is that miraculous seed. And so again, it's that idea of planting that seed corn but also we know that corn is one of our three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. And so uh, it, corn, that miraculous seed, it grows in community. And that's the intention behind the Ndaman program is that these folks are not only learning together, but they're doing it in community. And so we, are, we just wrapped up our, our second year of that program. As I mentioned, it's a seven week program via Zoom. Um, and for the first half of the Zoom, we invite Tribal, tribal leaders, um, different programs, uh, different uh, teachers in our tribe to give information about, about the tribe so that they, you know, everyone kind of is on the same level playing field as far as their understanding of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, ranging from history presentations to specific departments, service presentations to tribal leadership. Um, and then the second half of that program, that growing in community part, is the are the small talking circles. We, we split them up into breakout rooms on Zoom and they have their, their trip talking circles. And they now do a monthly reunion. These folks are really keyed in with each other. And again, these are people who maybe before this program didn't feel comfortable um, talking about their identity or didn't know anybody else. And now they're growing together. We also invited them to do a final project and left it wide open. And I have pictured for you here um, a cookbook that one of the student or one of the participants made 
they gathered a lot of Potawatomi recipes and pulled this cookbook together that they shared with the other participants. And it's a little story where they came from. So she talked about how learning about this made her want to kind of um, gather this knowledge that she had had um, into something tangible. And then the final effort I want to talk to you about quickly is our Mokiwak program. And Mokiwak in our language means essentially they are emerging, they are rising. And that is an opportunity to address that language loss. Uh, our nation, um, in addition to the other Potawatomi communities, there are a lot of great initiatives happening to um, reconnect us to our language. Um, but this is an opportunity to meet our college students where they are at the top universities, the, the, the universities where we have the highest population of citizen Potawatomi students. So we partnered with six universities throughout Oklahoma and Kansas. It is a Potawatomi centered, yeah, Potawatomi language one that we offered once last fall, we'll resume again this fall, and we'll begin offering Potawatomi language two this coming spring. And it's, it's uh, the Potawatomi language one is split seasonally, is meant to be again from this Potawatomi perspective. And their final project, which you're seeing here on the screen, one of our student um, examples, they have to write a children's book. Again, it's that idea that you are gaining this information and now you're going to give back, you're going to add to the body yourself. So one of the students who had never um, spoken Potawatomi before took this class as part of her project, wrote this children's book, and we had it printed. We are now, you know, we are in fact with her permission. We are now using that book as part of our language learning efforts at our child development centers here at the nation. But again, the idea is you're, you're getting this information and you're also giving. Them. And so um, to close, you know, why why does this matter, especially thinking of talking to other higher ed professionals or other universities, you know, that why does this specifically on a lot of new concepts matters? Well, you know, hopefully, hopefully, especially hearing from the other folks on this call, it's it's very clear that um, that we're not monolith, monolithic. Indigenous people as a whole, Native American people, individual tribes are not monolithic. I I couldn't speak. You know, sometimes we're asked about well, what is it like to be, you know what does Native American think about what do Native Americans think about this. I couldn't answer that. Much less could I answer what all citizens Potawatomi think about a certain topic. It is it becomes so specific community by community. But also, I think it's important to realize that many Indigenous students have complicated relationships to their identity, depending on where they were raised, depending on what that tribal history was, both largely and within their family. It's extremely complicated, and, and, and we'll all likely encounter students who are on some part of that spectrum but are still wrestling with their identity and what it means to be Potawatomi or whatever tribe and whether or not they are native or Potawatomi or whatever tribe enough. Um, also thinking about in personal tribal, person tribal programming, which is ideal, is often inaccessible for dispersed citizenship. So thinking about how we can use technology or other opportunities to help bring, this, um, bring folks together. And then really drawing upon tribes. I mean, it is, it's been an honor to work in this role at the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. And, and you know, a lot of tribes are trying to do the hard work and you know, wherever university is situated, there are local tribes um, in the area that may be able to, to help with some resources. So again, heartfelt thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to the conversation. And my email is there if, um, if you have any questions after this uh, session. Congrats. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, if folks are able to turn their camera back on, um, we can have some dialogue and uh, a chance to ask comments, be in conversation with each other, uh, if you wish. Uh, for those attending, please, please feel welcome, encouraged to put questions, reflections, thoughts you're having in the Q&A at the bottom. And uh, we'll try to get the, the, those as much as we can. Uh, if I might offer one point of uh, invitation to reflect um, to the group here, because I wrote the word down about 20 times as I was listening to everyone, intergenerational, and all of the ways that the work you are doing in community, with community, um, sometimes in, in different kinds of relation, is connecting across generations and building to the future. 
And I was thinking that, uh, you know, one of the core goals of this grant, the Just Futures Initiative, is exactly that emphasis on futures and the work that it takes to build different um, and, um, and stronger, right, futures. Uh, and so I, I just wanted to offer this. Uh, if you have thoughts you might want to share, experiences, challenges in attaining the resources, the structures, the spaces to do that, which are so often not how much of higher education is um, valid, is, is centered and valued, right? Uh, but thinking with ancestors, elders, youth, children, and those yet to come, what you might want to bring uh, into the mix or have those of us here this evening be thinking about, uh, especially as we're doing educational work in our own spaces. And please feel very welcome to just unmute, jump in and, and take this as you wish. Well, I'll jump in, uh, Christine, and that question. Thank you. I, I think that's a great question. Um, and I also want to say I want to thank every uh, my fellow panelists. Those were great presentations. I'm really uh, grateful to be with you all in this space. So at the University of Washington, when we applied for our first Mellon grant in 2018, one of the things we asked for that we thought was pretty standard was an elders in residence program. Many universities have them. Many communities have them, all kinds of school systems. And Mellon said no. Mellon said, we don't fund it. You know, elders and what would the CV look like and how would you vet these people? And and we thought it was the oddest response, you know, and we're like, so the way we responded, though, we said, well, what about we want to host native knowledge on campus? Our goal is to bring community based native knowledge to campus. What if we had something called native knowledge in residence instead of an elder in residence? Mellon bought that, which I thought was really interesting. So it was about the packaging for the funder who didn't quite understand what indigenous focused education might look like. And, but coming up with that concept was actually very useful for us because it made us focus on, well, what is it we really wanna to bring to campus? So in thinking about, so now we have a position we fund as like a half-time position for a community member who brings native knowledge to campus. We call them our native knowledge coordinator. Um, the first native knowledge we hosted on campus was the Lushootsi language. So our local indigenous language um, spoken by uh, Coast Salish peoples is Southern Lushootsi. And we had never had a, you know, a full-time uh, Southern Lushootsi language uh, speaker and teacher on campus. And so in our American Indian Studies Department felt like we're not a legitimate American Indian Studies Department if we do not teach the local indigenous language. So, like we're not serving our local native communities. And so we had started with a language table, then we had had um, a part-time course sequence. This allowed us to bring our Lushootsi language teacher, uh, Tammy Hone, who's Puyallup from Spokane, um, up to full-time. And she was able to offer then a sequence, a three-quarter sequence of the language, but also to work with then more advanced students who, to, who took the sequence in doing research projects. And so we teamed her up with our library system special collections, the ethnomusicology uh, library, archives. She's working to create the first Southern Lushootsi dictionary. A dictionary doesn't exist of Southern Lushootsi, and she's training students, so that next generation, how to work with settler documents to pull out indigenous language, um, put it into um, international phonetic alphabet, put it into a database, cross-reference it, and create the beginnings of a dictionary that will then serve local communities and future students. So that was exciting. And we used that leverage then. Now she's a full-time teaching professor at our university. We were able to get arts and sciences to make her a full-time faculty member, which has been really exciting. So we increased the number of faculty, increased the number of native faculty, as well as now we have sort of permanent indigenous language instruction in Lushootsi. And our, our new, uh, uh, indigenous knowledge uh, coordinator is um, Philip Red Eagle, who happens to be a, a member of our local community. Some of you will know him. He's a, a fairly well-known writer and artist um, with local connections, and he's uh, creating a canoe family on our campus. So canoe journeys is a really important part of local communities in the summer, um, got revived in the 1980s and then really going strong in the 1990s and early 2000s. Every summer, there are large gatherings of canoe families up and down the coast in the U.S. and Canada. 
And um, the university has never had its own canoe. And so we're working to build our own canoe family. And so Phil's been training our students on how to carve canoe paddles and then learn all the traditions that go with that. That will make it possible then for them to participate in canoe journeys in the summer. So that too, I think is very much this way of bringing native knowledge does affect future generations, right? And particularly working with both Tammy and Phil, it connects our students to local elders who have very specific types of knowledge, right? That they can bring that otherwise the university doesn't have at all, right? There's no PhD on campus who brings those particular um, types of knowledge. So yeah, I hope that that's helpful in, in thinking about that. And if I can add, I mean, that's such an important model and um, so helpful for other um, campuses to kind of consider. And, and, and if I could just take off my upstander hat and put on my Brown University hat for a moment and my position um, as tribal community member and residents, there is also an acknowledgement on behalf of Brown that there are other forms of knowledge capital that are particularly Native American and Indigenous students need to have access to during their time. And this concept, and this is this goes back to what's at the heart of many of the presentations here this evening, that in order to learn, you have to feel supported, mm -hmm. that human beings require support to do their best at any kind of educational endeavor. And so, um, you know, in my role as TCMR at Brown, and there's there's also a complimentary second TCMR also at Brown, um, uh, Sung Squa of the Hassanamisco uh, Band of Nipmucks, uh, Cheryl Hawley also uh, provides uh, these opportunities for our Native and Indigenous students to, during their time living in Providence, Rhode Island, make connections with Wampanoag, Nipmuc, and Narragansett communities, and that really undergirds um, the work that they're doing in a variety of disciplines. So all the disciplines that our students are engaged in um, have these um, opportunities for engagement with the tribal communities as well. So I think that it's such an important model, and thank you, Dr. Allen, for, for talking a little bit more about it. It's really important. And I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I think that every department um, on a campus should have a, a, a knowledge keeper in residence or someone who is there to support the spiritual and mental well-being of our students as they navigate predominantly white institutions. Yeah, maybe, uh, thank you all for what you mentioned. Maybe just to add on that aspect, I think that a key aspect is validation, right? In, in the sense like, unfortunately, uh, Many the traditional education may may assume that if a person does not have a PhD, then that person has nothing to contribute, and we need to work a lot with the wording and the and navigating those aspects. As as silly as it might sound, but that's important, and and not just to the uh, let's say the institutional level, as as it was mentioned um, by both of you but also to the new generations as well that maybe don't see the value because of this acculturation process. And, and there are, I mean, I have, I have had many students who they said, you know, I worked really hard to get into college. I don't wanna take a class on native studies. So, and we need to be patient with, with that process as well and building up this validation also so so it can benefit the community and therefore the youth little by little by seeing also the again we in an ideal world we shouldn't be we, we shouldn't need to to elevate let's say because i i hear that people use a lot the word elevate i don't i don't i'm not a big fan of it but just to explain the strategy uh it goes towards the institutions or the grant funding um places but also to generations who for so long have come to believe that maybe the, the only way to move forward is by going away from uh, indigenous practices and traditions, negotiating that and keeping that as also in a, uh, with, the, with the right language uh, is, is, is good. And also the, the, the process of building relationships. Um, sometimes, uh, I don't know about you, but, uh, Usually, let's say in, in academic spaces, is okay if we're going to do this project, we need a, an outcome on day one. And sometimes the first meeting is just um, like having, let's say, when inviting people from the communities, just 
making sure that they feel welcome, that they understand the potential ways of communicating and engaging, raising their hands, participating. Uh, and, and to me, that would be enough. But sometimes it's important to phrase that out into the process. So whoever who is uh, evaluating the effectivity of the program understands that that's also part of the timeline. And then we can move into uh, facilitating, sharing, et cetera. Uh, I was just thinking that for these Sketch Alliance gathering with, that we did uh, uh, two, we two weeks ago, we had uh, many elders come in and then we got messages from them saying, oh, we came uh, now after that we saw you all and we met you. Uh, now you can call us for, for workshops and activities. Right, which it makes sense, and I feel honored that that was a reaction. But that 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 but those steps that, let's say, the, the the typical scholar would be just you know, here is the event, here is the honorary, here is what you are invited to talk to. It, it, it's like no, wait a second, we need to add these layers and and but also of course mediate on how to express the complexity of the process. But of course, that in the long term, there's a bigger winning for everyone. I'm going to jump in here because I loved what you said about the elders. Um, one of the things, because of the Eurocentric mindset in academia and then our indigenous mindset, is that we don't go out, at least I was taught, you don't really go out and push yourself. You need to be invited. And so once the elders met you, then they feel comfortable enough to say, okay, I know you now, I've made the connection, the relationship, I will help. But um, sometimes it's very hard in academia, especially if you're indigenous, to um, walk that fine line, uh, you know, putting yourself out there or not putting yourself out there. But I will say I am so encouraged by um, all of the research that I've sort of caught up on in the last 20 years, because when, like I said, when I put my dissertation out there, I went back to my geology world of dinosaurs and microfossils. And um, so getting that phone call in 2019 was just kind of a shock. And so Katie wanted me to do a professional development with her group. And then I wrote a paper and oh my goodness, there's so much good work out there that everybody is doing. I am just so pleased that within 20 years or actually 10 years, so much is happening and that it's continuing to happen because of the universities starting to open up. So. I'll just, I just want to add um, to the wonderful comments so far that thinking about intergenerational um, components, uh, if I think back to our language, and I'm a, I'm a language learner myself, I, you know, I have a lot more to learn, um, but we have a word, which is, um, means um, simultaneously my great grandparent and also my great grandchild. It's not, they're not root words, it's not, this thing is like this thing, it is the same word. So that intergenerational, um, you know, uh, uh, in our language, it is built in that those generations are not here and here, they are the same, they are collapsed together. So when we're doing intergenerational work, that's why they're affected. <laughs> that's why you're, what, what's happening now is affecting seven generations from now, was planned for seven generations ago, because it is kind of a collapse in time, our great grand parents are our great-grandchildren, and that's built in, in, in one word <laughs> in, in, in our Potawatomi um, and our Anishinaabe Mo'olani language. So I wanted to share that um, as well. Thank you, Thank you so much for these reflections. And uh, the first question we have, I think, continues going even more deeply down, down this road. Um, so this is from Amanda Funk, uh, who uh, is a proud alumna of uh, Tessia's leadership program. Um, so already connections here. Uh, and the question is, how do we approach the dilemma of getting our community partners to even consider indigenous knowledge as legitimate and valuable? We get a lot of resistance in our community. I'd love to hear any insight. 
and that is open to, to anyone who might want to speak to that. All right, I'm gonna jump in. So um, indigenous ways of knowing, there's, it's hard to explain and there's so much there. And so for me, when I was teaching um, geology and my other science classes, I would bring in like the storytelling. And then I would bring in on um, your relationship to, you know, the earth or, you know, whatever, but you can sneak it in. I mean, that's, I call it my subversive teaching. I would sneak that in and because that's all part of it, isn't it? It's hard to explain. I'll let someone else do it. But, you know, that's why I said these little threads that I have, you can bring that into Eurocentric teaching. You can bring it into an instructional design model of Addy, you know, that the workplace uses. Um, you can bring it in. But to have someone respect that is something else. So I think maybe that might be part of that question is that how do you get other people to acknowledge and respect that indigenous way of knowing? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Barton. Maybe jumping into that, I, I do uh, also work with language and sometimes when we think of indigenous languages and uh, uh, we tend to imagine even how, what is the perception, the perception around the language? Like for example, when we even see a flyer of, for example, learning a European language. Uh, we know that it's not just the communication skills, but oral, the knowledge, literature, philosophy attached to that is an access to all of that. And sometimes uh, with indigenous languages that is not very clear uh, and therefore creating those strategies, um, I, I really enjoy uh, also Dr. Allen's presentation about the methodologies, for example, is, is very important to code it into this context and to, uh, in, in, in my experience, we have had the opportunity to partner with Fulbright to host uh, Fulbrighters in Quechua, for example, and which first it gives an a specific slot for an indigenous Quechua scholar to be recognized. We understand that Fulbright is seen as a prestigious um, scholarships, but so so we, we were very honored to be able to facilitate that and partner uh, with that and 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 offer mentoring to in this case to to young uh, indigenous scholars. But at the same time, understanding the coding of the perception that this fellowship have. Uh, within academia, or to um, some of you also mentioned the term global indigeneity. Sometimes, still for many people, global and indigenous feels like contradictions, right? But then, um, uh, many in the US uh, K to 12 system, it's very common that students engage with model UN, and, and indigenous issues are usually not present during that conversation of representing countries. But then, but as, at least they are familiar with the sense of the UN as a platform for global issues. And, and for example, I, I've, I've noticed with other colleagues, um, but also here at Harvard, we are also working, actually we're going next week, with a group of students to the UN for the forum on indigenous issues. And so that's another way on how students, we have students who are Lakota, who are Yaki, Quechua, uh, that of course they are going there because they have particular issues close to their heart and to their communities, but at the same time, they can indicate that that's part of a programming in terms of like diplomacy, public policy, and UN. So all of these constant negotiations that I've seen that uh, each of the panelists have shared, um, kind of like trying to answer that question is is uh, 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 is a factor that I, I think it's uh, we, we're always trying to navigate. Uh, so, but it's not it's not a it's not a minor aspect, uh, especially when a person is young and. And there's peer pressure, and or or again, as I mentioned, they just felt so much to get into college that they 
they feel like they can't afford to 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 don't deviate from from the expected curricula but yeah that's why we, we need to work on that my own orientation to this, my answer to this question is very unsatisfying, but really it, it is about the long game and it is about instilling within our K through 12 systems an understanding of intellectual humility and that indigenous epistemologies are older and more sustainable and regenerative to this continent. And so that kind of legitimacy or that kind of understanding of what is legitimate knowledge in on Turtle Island or in the United States, um, that needs to happen in mass and needs to happen in our public school systems. That, that's my orientation. And what is a long time for indigenous people is different from what is a long time for non-indigenous people. And I'm, I'm willing to, I sit in complete comfort of the fact that it may be seven generations down the road, uh, but that's fine by me. That's a blink of an eye. And I, I, I love the way you, you, you put that because I think, I think often, especially if we're talking about the school, the school context, um, the question is, why would we spend time on, you know, this, this ethnic or this cultural uh, programming when really it is all ethnic, it's all cultural programming, it's just naming that that's what's happening. It's naming whose culture it is that we are teaching in, this, in the schools and recognizing that we can be broader, we can be more inclusive, um, you know, Indigenous or Native American studies do not have to live only in social studies or history. They are um, by nature part of all of the types of um, all of the classes and all of the course areas. So really just naming that already uh, our schools are cultural um, environments. So uh, to pretend like Indigenous or Native American as some other is uh, is is just um, false. <laughs> I think we may have one more question popped in. I'll, I'll read this one out. So this is um, from Tom Van Winkle. Hi, Tom. Um, thanking everyone for the presentations. Uh, Tom writes, uh, as I listen, I am thinking about a powerful learning environment as it relates to indigenous pedagogies. I am concluding that the environment emphasizes intergenerational teaching and learning, the value of building relationships, the importance of ensuring all communities feel welcome, place-based learning, and intellectual humility. He adds, none of those attributes seem to describe the settler colonial higher education institutions that I am familiar with. What institutions out there do you feel are getting this right, if any? Anyone who'd like to take that one on? Your um, tribal colleges and universities are using the indigenous ways of knowing. Um, they are using intergenerational work. They incorporate the storytelling. They talk about, um, you know, following the Red Road. They incorporate it throughout. And that's why they were established, was to try to give equal, you know, I hate to say equal opportunity, but to have a place where Indigenous people could be in charge of their education to a certain extent. You know, there are still federal rules and things like that that are followed. We're very fortunate here in Wisconsin. We've got two of them, one in the north and then one right over on Menominee, about 15 miles away from me. And um, very small classes, uh, language classes, um, elders come in, kids come in. It's, it's a fun time. So they are working on that. But again, you still have you know, the assessments and a lot of those assessments of the students are done on the Eurocentric assessment basis when they're coming into school or when they're leaving school. So those are not culturally um, relevant. Um, they need to be revised as well. But that's work for the future, as Indana said. She's very good with that. Um, I love what you said, you know. That's what I love this new generation. They've, they've got the fire and they've, they're gonna do great work. I would add to that. I don't know if anyone's getting it right in the major you know, dominant academy, but I think lots of people are trying. And I think we should acknowledge that, that many of our institutions 
uh, particularly in the last decade, have really made strides to, to center more indigenous knowledges, indigenous pedagogies, um, and to think about how to care for native students, uh, whether they're traditional age students, whether they're transfer students, whether they come back to school after having other careers or other lives. Um, and I, I think that's really important and that individual faculty and groups of faculty, I think are really trying uh, very hard to think about this. Um, one of the things we've done at the University of Washington that I think is being very powerful for graduate education is we created a graduate certificate in American Indian and Indigenous Studies. It's like a graduate minor. And it's open to any PhD student in any discipline from across our university. And we created it and anchored it in our Department of American Indian Studies. So even though our Department of American Indian Studies only has an undergraduate major and minor and doesn't have a graduate program, we were still able to anchor the graduate certificate there so that AIS faculty can control it. And the way these kind of graduate minors are set up at our university, there's two required courses, an elective and then a capstone. And so we've created the, the required courses as an indigenous methodologies course and an indigenous theory course. And we've decided we're gonna always team teach them. So it's always two faculty who have um, disciplinary expertise in two different disciplines working together. Um, students have to apply, they have to be doing the certificate to take the course. So we have quite a bit of control. They have, since we started it a few years ago, they fill every time we offer them. There's so many students across disciplines who want access, A, to indigenous faculty members and B, to indigenous methodologies and theories. And I'm lucky, I have colleagues like Diane Millian, Charlotte Cote, Jean Dennison and stuff who, who are teaching these courses. So we have really amazing people teaching these courses and giving these students that experience. But the other part of it that's so important is that the students get to meet each other. So even if a particular PhD student is isolated in their program, they're the only native student, say, in their you know, marine biology or something like that, they can find other um, native students as well as native faculty. And we're finding that that community building is so key. And so this graduate certificate has really helped build community among graduate students, helps them find faculty as well. And the faculty who get to teach these courses find it really helps them. People feel better about the academy when they get to work with these students in these um, situations. We're kind of calling it now like a, a whole ecosystem of support. We're realizing that you have to support undergrads and graduate students and faculty and staff and your community partners. If you only focus on one of those components, it doesn't work because it's not a complete ecosystem. And so through our Center for American Indian and Indigenous Studies and through our Department of American Indian Studies, we're, we've been able to kind of create a kind of series of programs that support all of those different aspects of being part of the university. Um, it takes a lot of work and it has to be, takes a lot of intentional, you know, thinking through what it looks like and how to support. Um, but I think lots of us are trying. I know um, I happen to be today, but before it got into this, we're hosting um, some faculty from the University of Victoria who are coming and from University of Minnesota because they want to learn from us like how to set up a center similar to ours. And I think there's a lot of this, this conversation we're having right now where we're exchanging ideas and trying to help each other um, figure out how to support our students in different environments. And maybe sometimes we want to answer like the big question, like which institution is doing it right? Maybe each of you is doing it or trying to do it right by building up projects, by trying to listen, by trying to exchange experiences. And then that that might turn into long-term plans. Uh, I, I can think of uh, here at Harvard, is starting last year, we have a native and indigenous commencement ceremony. And that was a personal initiative or particular initiative that had a eco into HUNAP, which is a university Native American program, and now it's institutionalized. And, and sometimes many initiatives that indigenous communities push as decolonizing institutions are embraced by instit the institution more as just diversity and inclusion. But each community will find a way to find the right compromise and to then push for 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 um for whatever that at that particular moment 
could be a good shift. Um, so yeah, I, I, I sometimes I'm a, uh, yeah, we don't have to necessarily have everything right, <laughs> uh, but push and uh, as much as we can and and then uh, well, yeah, things will keep improving. Yeah, hopefully. I want to be optimistic, yeah. <laughs> I think here in, in our corner of the Northeast, um, there is, and this can be said, I think, across the country, um, there is an extractive relational dynamic between the universities um, here and the tribal nations on whose land these universities are built and where they're occupied. And that extractive dynamic is really a hoarding of knowledge and capital. And if we um, look at and we take an approach that is a more uh, that is an older and better approach to how knowledge is dispersed across communities, um, then we can see that these universities have an accountability and an obligation to disperse that knowledge, um, especially to the tribal nations that are within their own backyard. Um, and so uh, I think that there is an onus on all of our uh, respective uh, organizations and our universities to um, provide uh, uh, access to our universities uh, for our tribal students and that that addition of or that influx of tribal students into the ecosystem uh, will also, as, as Dr. Allen was saying, shape and transform the institution itself, um, which is really um, uh, 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 less of an extractive dynamic and more of one that is circular in nature. Um, and that all, you know, for me personally, um, I, I see the work that we're doing at Brown as very intentional in, in dispersing the knowledge that's been hoarded um, there in that institution. Thank you so much for this. Uh, and want to share out a question uh, thinking about organizing and different connections, alliances, solidarities, possibilities. Uh, this one from Joy James. Um, what alliances or connections with African Americans and Afro Indigenous people given repression of historical texts about liberation and captivity? Um, so alliances, connections with African Americans and Afro Indigenous people, if that is something that you have been working on uh, in your own context. Certainly a lot of work to be done in that area. And just you know, one small uh, thing that I'll share uh, here from the Tribal Nation perspective, um, and actually I had to miss tonight's meeting for, for this presentation, but uh, we, our Tribal Nation has partnered with our local Black community here in Shawnee to host a Juneteenth celebration each year. That was something where our tribal nation has committed resources to that. Um, we are, it has a lot of aspects to it, but one that is extremely important to us is to acknowledging not just the history of Juneteenth, but also our local context, particularly the five, five tribes located in Oklahoma and their history with the freedmen and how that liberation happens even after Juneteenth. <laughs> so we're celebrating Juneteenth and yet their, um, their liberation from enslavement happens after that fact. So it's a very small step, but it is something that we're hoping to acknowledge. We have some, um, some work that we are, some, some articles that we're sending out to the local schools for them to participate in an art contest, but it's explaining that history and it's making it local and it's including that intersectionality and that really fraught history between um, Afro-Indigenous, uh, Black communities, freedmen, um, because it's still alive and well, um, unfortunately, um, that complexity is alive and well here within Oklahoma. Maybe my comment is a bit more conceptual, but sometimes in academia, things can be very siloed. I do this, and therefore I don't know about that. Uh, and and the, uh, the system doesn't punish us for actually not looking for a more holistic understanding, uh, even within the indigeneity. Uh, many people are not aware, or, or when they hear that word, uh, they don't necessarily assume that there are indigenous communities across the world in what we now know as Japan, South Africa, 
uh, Sweden, right? And and therefore um, that that expansion also of indigeneity has to come to uh, solidarity with other other groups. In this case, in the particular case of the U.S. With the African American community, but also as as Tessa was mentioning, the intersections like how much when we even think of the representation of U.S. Native American communities, are we aware of Afro Wampanoag here, for example, in Massachusetts land where I am uh, I am uh, um, connecting from uh, in Lenape Hawking in the city of Philadelphia. There are many Afro Lenape uh, community members and leaders that don't necessarily come to our collective imaginary of indigeneity and US Native American, um, yeah, let's say community members. So I would even start by, by that just to, to engage more and listen more and, 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 and let's say people who are in school or studying to actively look for that because it, it unfortunately not, at least I would say right now, it won't come naturally. We would need to intentionally go for and learn and engage, and but that could be a hopefully a right step to then care for the different aspects, reparations, dispossessions from different communities. But again, even within indigeneity, to find uh, the presence of uh, Afro uh, um, um, blackness within uh, that uh, within those boundaries as well. I would just pick up on that and say, I really agree with that idea that all of us, depending on where we're situated, there are opportunities to think across multiple forms of indigeneity and then also how in particular indigenous populations have intersected with multiple and not to always recenter whiteness, which is the tendency of the academy, right, is to center whiteness and then everyone in relation to, right, European history, white American history, dominant history, and instead to think about other forms of relationality. Um, I know here at my campus, we've done some really interesting events, putting, say, inviting both a Native writer and an African American writer, not to speak separately, but to speak in conversation. So we had Leanne Simpson and um, Pauline Gums here, for instance. And uh, that was an amazing conversation because they spoke to each other as well as to the audience. And, that, and, and the audience getting to watch them speak to each other and have that conversation in a kind of public forum was very powerful. Um, Seattle has a, a very long standing and large Scandinavian settler population, but that also means there are Sami people here who have been here for multiple generations and um, Scandinavian studies is a major department on my campus. And so we've helped Scandinavian studies um, learn to do Sami studies, right? And to bring Sami uh, studies in conversation with American Indian studies in the US and Canada, but also because we have a large Pacific Islander population on our campus in conversation then with oceanic studies as well. And so like, what does that look like when we talk about Sapni, Oceania and Native North America at the same time? We do a three-way conversation. We decenter whiteness, we decenter the dominant, but we think about indigeneity in multiple forms, right? And how, and, and different histories that have intersections that, are, that might be productive. Um, certainly productive for students to get out of, say, the typical binaries that um, have structured their education often K through 12 and then when they come to college. So I think a lot of us, you know, one theme here is always localizing and what are your resources, who are your communities, um, how could you bring them into conversation in ways that would really perhaps disrupt the sort of business of us as usual of the dominant academy. Thank you so much for these reflections and uh, a number of these, there's another question uh, that came in about global indigeneity and I, I think we heard some wonderful um, reflections on that. We have reached the end of time tonight and people may have other things to do in their life today. Um, so thank you profoundly for this. Uh, this has been so heartening and I know that we will be sharing this out with many colleagues at Williams College. Uh, as a way of furthering that spark and motivation and the urgency of it. Um, so if we could thank our panelists this evening and uh, wishing you all a wonderful rest of your day, wherever it may take you. Thank you. Thank you.